David Lee King comes to us from Kansas. He's the Digital Services Director at Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library. He blogs, writes, and speaks about emerging trends, social media, digital experience, and most importantly for us right now, website management. So please join me in welcoming David Lee King. That's awesome. Thanks, guys, for coming. I appreciate it. Um, that was sort of funny what Dave said about the Aegis thing. And some of you guys sort of snickered and related. I can relate to that too. My first library job out of library school was in 95. And I see I worked at U the University of Southern Mississippi, something like that. And they didn't have a website yet because it was 95. Nobody did. Um, they had heard about this new website thing and they said, we need one. Who wants to do it? And it, it was like we were in a line and all the old people stepped back. <laughs> okay with that. <laughs> That's how I got started in all this stuff. So that and at the time switching out the database CD-ROMs in the whole tower. That was my, my exciting job. <laughs> Thankfully we don't have to do that anymore. Um, can you guys hear me? Do we need the mic? No. <coughs> in the back? What? <laughs> <laughs> Making sure. Please God work. <laughs> Yay. All right, is that a little better? Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah, all right. Because <laughs> that's all you get. So. <laughs> Just saying. Um, well, you guys apparently like websites. Uh oh. Not so much. <laughs> you have websites. Um, and this morning I hope to um, share some of what my library is doing and just some, some good ideas, some tips on um, website user experience. Because we can all make that better on our websites, right? My website included. We're not there yet either. So that's what we're going to focus on for this talk. And um, basically goals is just um, making our website user experience rock a little bit more than it does now by looking at some easy to implement tips and tools that hopefully will improve the experience your customers are having. But first, um, why are we talking about this? Uh, boring stats. Woo! Um, these are monthly stats that my library reports to our board. And I just want to show you something. And you guys tell me how important our website is when we look at this stuff, OK? So this would be our, our monthly circulation broken out by a bunch of really boring stuff. Um, so total circulation, um, my question here is how many of those things that are checked out start with our library catalogs? What do you think? Because <laughs> I don't know, but I'm guessing it's most of them. There are some people that visit and just browse the shelves and pull stuff off, right? By and large, most people are checking out our catalog at some point, right? And where does that reside? On our websites? So how important is our website? It's pretty important. Um, total new registrations. Um, a lot of registrations for the month. Those are new card holders. Um, again, that we, we do online registration. So all those people have to touch our website. The, the first time they're visiting my library, so to speak, they're getting a library card. And they're experiencing yeah, the building, in some cases, because we have a computer set up right by the CERC desk, and we say, that's where you registered. But they're also experiencing part of my website. How important is that to new customers? Pretty freaking important. Um, one other, visits to the library and visits to the building. So gate count, 64,000 people coming in and out of the building each month. We're a busy library. We have about 3,000 people. Or so a day, isn't it? Um, let's see. Yeah, right in there. Actually, right over here for the newest month, April, 71,000 people visited the website. So, ooh, which is more important, the building or the website? <laughs> I'm a web guy, so, woo! <laughs> we rock! Um, but, I, and I don't know if your guys' stats match up with this. It will be different depending on the size of the library, size of you know, urban versus rural area, that kind of thing. But either way, your website is growing in importance. In some cases, more people are visiting your website than walking into your building. 
and, and now think about staffing levels <laughs> of your digital branch versus your physical branch where not as many people visit. <gasps> All the library directors cover your ears. Um, but my, I'm just pointing out, this is why I'm talking about this, this is why you guys are here because our websites are actually pretty important things these days. If not the most important thing that your library has, it's one of the very important things that your library is doing. It's, it's in many cases, the front door to your library, to the full library experience. So, I think we want to make that better. Don't you guys agree with that? Yeah. I think so. So that's why we're talking about this. Um, two other slides here. Just saw this, um, I think this was a Pew report, I can't remember. 87% of Americans have access to the internet. That's a lot of people. Wow. Um, either at school, work, or at home, um, or at Starbucks, <laughs> they're accessing your website. Um, not all of them are using desktop or laptop computers either. There's a growing number of people that just access the web through their smartphones. Actually, oddly enough, lower income people, they don't necessarily have a desktop, but they all, even homeless people that visit my library, they have a smartphone. That's how they stay connected. That's how they're staying connected to my library. Um, so, if you look at that number, that's most of your customers have access to your website. Don't know if they visit, but they have access to it. They have the means to do that. So, um, I just, I love what, this is um, a company called Influx. They, they build library websites and make um, library user experience type things better. It's weareinflux.com. Um, they, they have these little blank notebooks that they put out just for fun, but I love what it says on it. Every decision we make affects how people experience the library. So let's make sure we're creating improvements. That's my goal for you guys this morning, is to just give you some tips um, that will help you make improvements to your library's website and, and the user experience. So this is why I think that your guys' job, whoever touches the website, it's the most important job in the library. That and the guy who cleans the toilets. <laughs> Same. Pretty important stuff. Um, so, this, this presentation is broken out into three areas, or three C's, of, of user experience. Um, construction, content, and customers. So, first we'll touch on construction. So this would be the parts and pieces of your website, the back end, build, the visual look, the functionality of your website. So let's let's talk about some of those a bit. First, um, that I just mentioned, would be mobile. These days, your website has to work on, on a mobile device. It has to work on smartphones and tablets. Um, used to be that kind of thing was an afterthought. It would be like, yay, we have a website. Yeah, it doesn't work so well on a mobile device, and that's okay. Um, or maybe we're going to buy an app for that and make it work. Um, and for many libraries, honestly, that's still where they are. That's OK. It's a process. We're all growing and learning. Um, somebody, somebody would say, yeah, we know we should. We just haven't done, haven't done that yet. I don't think it's much of an option for us anymore. And, and here's why. So according to Nielsen ratings, 75% of Americans on smartphones. Uh, Pew Report, it's a it's a little smaller amount, 64%. But either way, it's over half of your customers on smartphones. That's how they access stuff. That's how they talk to their friends. That's how they check the hours of the library, that kind of thing. That's how they check stuff out, if they can. Um, and, and those, depending on demographics, those percentages vary. So younger people, um, as in 20, well, 18 to 34 years old, um, would be more like 85, 86% own smartphones. Um, pretty important stuff. So think about this for a second. How many of you guys visited a website today on your smartphone? About a third and a half of you in the last week. A little few more. So put your hands up again. That, those of you raise your hands. So that would be your customers, right? So about your library's website, is it going to be a good experience or not so good? Just, you don't have to answer. <laughs> just, just think about that. Okay, and so if you're older, um, 
Over age 55, 51% own smartphones, and that's growing. Um, my um, now 18-year-old son, he, most of my family has Apple products like iPhones, and he wanted to do something different, so he got the Samsung Galaxy S4 thing, whatever. He was so happy that it was so different from the rest of the family, but then I had to break it to him that his grandmother bought the same phone. <laughs> so the, the worst part of that, not, not, not so much that the coolness factor went down, but that he was tech support. <laughs> <laughs> and she uses it a lot. She likes to geocache. Do any of you guys geocache? Okay, so it's a very frustrating experience for her, but she gets it done. Um, and I always tell her, you should have bought an iPhone, I could have helped you. <laughs> because the son, he's just like, you do this, you do that, and there. What'd you just do? Um, but, she's a really good example of that. Aging, she's probably 78 or so. She's got a smartphone. Um, and she's using it to do multiple things, just like you think anybody would be doing with a smartphone. Um, so, these, these people with smartphones, do you guys have content for them that works you know, from your library's website? Hopefully, hopefully you do. Uh, just again, something to think about. Um, you know, in, in the US, mobile is really sort of driving what's happening online these days. Um, US homes have 1.4 tablets per household. We had two this last year. My son just graduated high school. Um, his whole school, they gave all the high school students um, iPads to do their schoolwork. Yeah, I, I saw some eyes rolling. <laughs> um, it sort of kind of worked because they, they did that part really well. They distributed them really well. They didn't so much help the teachers figure out what to do on them as well as they could have. Some of the assignments I saw were pretty funny, actually. Um, yeah, write on this PDF file. <laughs> okay. How's that supposed to work? Um, we spend 130 minutes a day with smartphones and tablets compared to 170 minutes a day watching TV. I would have to guess a lot of that's at the same time. Right? So those of you who with smartphones or tablets, how many of you have watched your favorite show or a game and been on Facebook or Twitter, like, what in the world's going on? Yeah, yeah, right? That's just part of the experience these days. It's, it's fun. We have social TV for the first time, right? Except, I guess, at the sports bar, where they have forever. Um, this would be some analytics from my library's website about a year ago. So this would be um, devices used to access my library's website. So, let's not do that. Wrong button push. 67% um, that would be computers. That includes computers at my library, so laptops and desktops. But then over a third, um, and that's growing, are using mobile devices of some type. That was a year ago. The year before that, it was in the teens, percentage-wise. So um, smartphones would be the 20% thing there, and then 13% on tablets of some type, which actually, I, that was bigger than I thought it would be. Uh, shouldn't, shouldn't be surprised, because more and more people are buying those. But it's over a third of my customers at, in Topeka, Kansas, sweet little town, in the middle of the country. Um, using mobile devices to access my library's website. That's why I'm harping on this so much. It's really important and that's growing, like gangbusters. Because my grandma now has a phone. <laughs> my mother-in-law, I should say. My grandma, not so much. <laughs> She's dead, so this wouldn't work real well. It's heavenly, heavenly smartphones, there we go. Um, so a lot of people who are designing websites are starting to think um, in terms of this idea called mobile first design. So basically if you're making a new website or you're redesigning your website, they put the mobile experience first. So they think, okay, well how does it work on this? And then, then they expand out. So they want to make sure it's highly readable, highly clickable, um, scrollable these days on a mobile device. They think about that experience first and then they stretch it out to think about the fuller experience on the desktop computer or a laptop computer. Um, sort of a sort of backwards than we used to think about it.
uh, we used to think, let's build a big website. You know, we were worried about the, the whole idea of being under or above the fold. We don't worry about that so much. Anybody who has a smartphone, you do this, right? There's no fold anymore. It's just scrolling until you find what you want. A little different experience. Um, but so the philosophy with mobile first also extends even a little further to this idea. If you can't do it on a mobile device, you probably don't need to build it at all, or you really re need, to, you need to rethink about how you're building it. So it does work on the mobile device. Um, tell that to some of our ILS vendors, right? Because huh. some, of, some of our library catalog systems don't work on mobile devices yet. Ah, what's going on there? Some of our databases don't either. Not a good thing. Um, so this is maybe how your website would work on a variety of mobile devices um, using something like responsive design. That's what my library does anymore. So same set of code works on different devices and just says, oh, that's a smartphone. I need, I need this. I need to be skinny and long. And then it will rearrange itself as you get to the larger tablet experience and the laptop experience and the desktop screen experience. So it contracts and expands appropriately. Um, sometimes it's also called adaptive design. But so if you're not familiar with responsive design, that's something to look into, to read about. A lot of modern content management systems like Drupal and WordPress, there are themes that just do that anymore. Good thing. So you don't have to actually code it, which is nice thing. Um, but this kind of thing is really important because it's a really easy way to have your content accessible on all sorts of devices. So this is my library's website on a smartphone. This is what it looks like. It looks like we were going to be closed that day. Um, we have a little message up there. But it stretches out, contracts, depending on what we need. So take a peek at that. And if you want to see that work, you know, either pull it up on your smartphone or just take your, your browser edges on your, on your browser and shrink it down, and you'll see the content rearrange as a fun stuff. Um, so that's one thing to talk about. Let's talk about consistency. A consistent site, though. So I don't know if you guys have, have noticed this about websites, but modern websites are looking sort of the same right now, in a way. Um, so comparing my library's website to a huge website like CNN.com, there's a lot of similarities. And <laughs> accidentally, because we weren't thinking about this so much, we were just thinking about modern website design. But then when I started Looking at a lot of websites, CNN, BBC, Amazon, even Facebook, that kind of thing, they're all using similar type things. So what, what do we have here? Well, we've got the logo up in the top left corner, um, and maybe some, some little bitty um, links, like with CNN, big site like that, they need the international and different links like that. A search box on the right, so in their case, that would be for their, their new stuff. In our case, that would be for our website and our catalog. Then after that, um, well, in their case, they have an ad. They have an ad. <laughs> um, so that could be fun, right? Um, and then they usually have different types of navigation bars that are horizontal. So we've got, you know, this is sort of our, our main navigational bar. Then they have some, some big things that are popped out, their editor's choice articles, those few articles they really want you to see. In our case, we have those three big blue buttons. So our catalog, our downloadables, like our ebooks and Hoopla and that kind of thing, and our databases. Um, pulled out and popped out so you can see them. Then they usually have CNN. In CNN's case, they have the one big story. Apple's website, they have the one thing they want you to buy. So it would be the Apple Watch right now, big and bold. Um, my library's website, we've got the carousel thing, so four or five top events or services, that kind of thing we want you to see. And then it gets more detailed after that. Um, both sites have a lot of white space, a lot of bold colors. Um, poke around the web at some of your favorite sites. You go to like a, a web ranking website like alexa.com, look at the top 10, top 20 websites. You'll see some similarities. They all have um, white space, horizontal navigation bars, um, 
more detail-y things usually on the left and stories on the right, sort of like a blog is arranged these days. Um, website designers are sort of standardizing right now. I don't know if that will stay the same, but you know, if you think about something like a car door, your, your car, your automobile, um, pretty standard, right? You've got usually the, the thing that either cranks or the, the thing that pushes, you know, the, the button for the window to roll up or down. It's going to be right there. The, the door is right there so you can get you know, the door latch to open it. It's not something you really ever think about, right? It's pretty standard. You can figure it out pretty easily. That's how websites are starting to be built right now. So that's a pretty good thing, right? If it's working for Amazon, multi-billion dollar company, that works for CNN.com, probably going to work for our library too, because those guys have you know department, web departments as big as this room. <laughs> They're trying to figure this stuff out, so it's a good thing to copy sometimes. Um, also, um, some of your library websites might not have a content management system, a CMS. Um, get one, and I, I would say get a normal one. That's why the normal's up there. So look at WordPress or Drupal or Joomla, some of the top ones. I often, when, when I'm doing these types of talks, somebody will come up to me and say, yeah, we still use Dreamweaver, which means they still hand code their website. If you do, that's okay. I would, I would suggest moving, moving to a content management system. You'll love it, <laughs> I guarantee. And your, your staff will love it too. Because for you know, my library <coughs> website is pretty blog-based and, and page-driven, so you know, there's lots of services, lots of websites, web pages on, on my library's website with different services that staff handle. All it's, it's like typing in Microsoft Word. They type their stuff, they press a button, it's up on the web. It's pretty simple stuff. Rather than having to know all the back-end coding and that kind of thing. So if you're not here yet, please get here soon. It will make your lives and the lives of the rest of your library staff so much easier. It's a good thing. Um, I like, I like WordPress, and that's because about half of the internet right now is using it. So it's got a huge user base. Uh, in many cases, if you're a big enough library to have a web developer, um, that web developer, if he, has, he or she has a question, they can just go out to WordPress forums and the question will be answered within five minutes. It's sort of like a, a support desk. Drupal is a little bit like that as well, and Joomla is a little bit like that. And then it sort of goes down. Just saying, use one of these. Um, please, please, please. Also, okay, so you don't know if you're doing well if you don't measure what's going on, right? So look at your analytics. Do you guys look at, you have analytics for your websites? A lot of you do, okay. Do you use them? <laughs> yeah, some of you do, some of you don't. So it's a good thing to look at. So what should you look at? Well, I, I, I don't think there's any one great thing to look at with analytics. Instead, figure out what your library's goals are, and then try to figure out how those analytics match up with that. That's what I would say. So, uh, for you know, they're they're easy and harder statistics to figure out. So the easy stuff would be the number of users. You know, we looked at that earlier. Saw that there's 76,000 people that visit my library's website. In one month. Yay! We want that number to go up, right? Because there's 180,000 people that live in Shawnee County, my service area. So we want all of those people visiting. Um, so that number should be growing. Harder but doable things would be some, maybe some specific things. Like, you know, summer readings coming up, right? Mm -hmm. Started at my library, maybe it started in your guys' library. Suddenly, my library's gotten a lot busier. <laughs> Um, and our youth services librarians are all like, oh, I'm going crazy right now, which is it's a good thing I'm here today. Um, but maybe we can match up like summer reading sign up if you, if you do a sign up online. You can find out how many people are going there. Like maybe you have advertised your summer reading program on Facebook or something like that, or made a, a special URL that you passed out on a business card or something. You can track that kind of stuff to see, oh look, 900 people came last month and signed up through this link. Then that's really good information to take you know, to library administration, to your board, and say, look, this stuff works. Here's how. You can prove it. Um, 
And you can prove that we're using your website that way. So, good thing. Or maybe, you know, just did they find out an event from your online calendar or something like that. So, some things to look at. These would be some one month numbers on my library's website. Um, mm -hmm. I like to see, well, more, most popular pages. That's always a good thing to know. Um, well, for a few reasons. One, it just shows what people are looking at, you know, on your library's website. But it also will inform um, sort of what, what's going on and what customers are thinking of. So when I took this screenshot, um, our employment section, that's always, since the economy tanked, that's been a top two or three thing at my library's website. Um, and I, we, we discovered early on it's not because everybody wants to work at the library. Darn, right? <laughs> um, they're looking for jobs, and they, they see, somehow they, they saw that button, or they found it in a local Google search, and they went there. And so we've rearranged some of that stuff, so you get library jobs and job search stuff on that page. You're trying to help customers out. That kind of um, Ebooks, fifth thing on there. I, which is awesome too. Uh, people are trying to find your ebooks. And that's actually why you know those, those big blue buttons we have on our website. That's why those exist because more and more customers are wanting our, our electronic ebook type content. And so we try to figure out a better way to you know, help them find it. Um, seems to be working because that, that button has been, that, that link has been growing in popularity. Um, what else do we look at here? Well, we look at time spent on the site or on the page. That's sort of this middle column here. Um, that's actually really useful stuff to know. So, for example, um, number 22, we, it looks like we wrote an article about knitting or crocheting. Okay, exciting stuff, right? Um, but what this tells me. One minute, 38 seconds was spent on probably three, 400 word article. That, meant, that means they read it, right? That, that's about the length of time you need to read it. Um, three, 334 people read it, which is pretty cool. Um, we did a, where is that, number seven, public computer use survey. We were getting ready to refresh our computers, and so we asked customers what they wanted. Um, they spent, where did Five, almost six minutes on that, that means a lot of people filled it out, right? Now we have the responses too, but we can also show, okay, people are spending time on that. They're taking time to fill it out. So that, that's a good thing to know. Um, so that, that's sort of how we use some of our statistics besides the normal you know, monthly reporting. It's good stuff to know. Um, a couple other things with construction. Um, different ways to say this. And who has read this book? <laughs> All right, I would suggest everybody read this book. If you if you ever touch websites, this is the one book to read. I would say. Don't make me think the revisited one, the newest one by Steve Krug, um, says a common sense approach to web usability. And the whole title of the book, that's exactly what he's talking about. He wants your website to be so easy to use that you don't have to think about how to use it. Right, my, my door example earlier, you don't have to think about that. There's another way to say that. So light switches, when you walk into a dark room, you flip the switch and you get on about your business, right? You don't have to think about how the light switch works, um, except if you go to another country where it's weird. Sometimes some of you may experience that. I was actually in a hotel once that you had to use your, your key card somewhere, and I, didn't, I couldn't figure that out for us. I was like, how do I turn the lights on? Um, trying to figure it out. But normally, you don't have to think about that. Nobody's thinking about electricity or the electrician, right? You're just, okay, what was I doing in this room? That's exactly how easy we need to make our websites. So our customers don't have to think about functionality at all. They're, they're not like hunting around for a button or trying to figure out, well, what am I supposed to do next? Well, Make it so easy that they don't have to think about that stuff, but that they can think about whatever it is they want to think about. Make sense? All right. So that's what we're. That's that's our goal. Um, all right. So that was a little bit on construction. Now let's focus on content. Um, why? Because everybody's website has content, right? And 
Um, you can make content really, really good and raw. We can make it really bad and unusable. Um, pretty easily. Pretty easily done. So, with content, you want to make sure it's conversational. Um, not, not chittery chattery, but um, using informal conversational language, language that your customers would actually use. So the best way to do that is to, what I say, type like a talk. Um, my, my boss, Rob Banks, um, slightly older than me, um, he learned to write, you know, in high school, he learned to write business letters, business style writing. Um, you know, most a lot of us librarians have master's degrees. We learned academic writing. Uh, that's not the writing I'm talking about. So when I, for a while, my my boss was wanting to blog and wanting to get into Twitter a little more and figure that out. And so what, what we actually said was, okay, so type your thing out, whatever it is you want to say, and then read it back to yourself out loud. So actually say it. And if it doesn't sound sound like something that you would actually say to me. Rewrite it until it does, and and that's for a while. He was actually see him in his office, you know, reading out his tweets out loud. <laughs> um, works really well because his typing style and his talking style are very different. He's he's a very conversational person, just not when he was typing because he wasn't trained that way. So that's a really good way to figure out that more conversational style of writing. Um, it's really important because on the other end, when your customers are reading something on your website, these days, they're, they're hearing the conversation in their head. And if they're not hearing the conversation, it sounds like a marketing brochure, and they're done that fast. So that, that's why this is so important. Um, also, I would say a, a, another good way to do this is to think a bit like a reporter. So anybody familiar with that inverted pyramid style of writing that reporters use? You know, they put they, they, they front load content. They put the most important stuff right up top. You know, not really any introductions so much uh, to the service, but or, or in their case to the article, they just say, here's what happened, here's what happened, here's why. And then they start fleshing out details further down in the article. That's the kind of writing style we want to do on our website. So Upload the content, put the most important stuff way up at the top, right there. Don't have two paragraphs of why it's so important and why we love our customers and then get down to what you're talking about. That's what most of us do, quite honestly. Flip that. Put the most important stuff first. Um, even with titles, uh, like, like if you have a blog or you have a, you know, a service page, do the same thing with your title. Um, of that page or that or that post or article, um, front load the content there too. So a really good place to look to see who does that well would be the BBC. They tend to have five to six words per title for every article they do, and just by looking at that title of, of the article, you can tell what it's about. Just just like that, they're experts at that. So check out you know BBC.com or .co.uk whichever. Um, See what they're doing and try to mimic that, because it works really well. Also, um, focus on benefits rather than features. So we're all librarians. We, we all like the detail. That's sort of why we're in this profession, right? Uh, we, we know how to do detail and functionality and explain the advanced search page and the mark record and all that kind of stuff. That, that's what we do. We're trying to do that. And that's awesome. Um, our customers don't really care about all that stuff. They, they want to get to what, what it is they want to get to. So explain the benefits, the why. Um, so instead of describing the process and tools and buttons, it's maybe a little better to focus on these types of questions. Why should I care? And, and what's this do for me? So the benefits, you know, why would I ever use that database? Why would I ever use that service? Um, another way to say that would be to focus on the call to action. So why should I be here? You know, every page on your website should tell them probably two things. What, why should I be here? And what am I supposed to do next? I can actually remember my son when he was three and, and he was getting a little kid's vacation Bible school award or something like that. And we were sitting it back and I suddenly heard this kid go, what am I supposed to do? And that would be my son. <laughs> hey, Nathan, that's awesome. But that's how our customers
consumers are when, when they're on any page on their website. They're like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? And, and we need to tell them right up front, right? So here's an okay example. This would be Chef Chattanooga Public Library. Um, they're a bit wordy. This is Hoopla. This is a, you know, a Netflix-like service for libraries. Maybe a few too many words to describe this service. But they, they do have the two things that I, I'm telling you about. They've got benefits. They say, you know, here's what this is. It's a way to stream and download ebooks and movies and stuff like that. Um, and they're, what do I do next? Way at the bottom, but, but they say, to get started, visit Google's website, create an account, then you can start watching stuff. I would have flipped that. So probably that very last paragraph needs to be up here at the top, followed by this paragraph, and then all this other junk, right? Or honestly, that other junk could be a link. For more details, go here. And then if nobody ever clicks that, delete the page in six months. Um, honestly, would be surprised, most of us could delete that page in six months. Um, but the point here is that they, they have those two things. So good example um, of what, what we're trying to do that. My library's website, we try to do that with everything we do. We, we sometimes fail. I've got an example of that later. Uh, but our, our three big buttons there, all answer that what do I do next question. That's why they're worded like they are. So our catalog, it doesn't say library catalog or, or you know, some academic libraries, they have pet names for their catalog. You know, they, they you know, go to Alexa or whatever. Um, ours says check it out, download it. That one's a really hard one to figure out because you're not downloading everything. But then some people are literal, right? Um, some people call it e-resources. Figure out what works for your customers. And for our customers, download it works really well. And then the databases. Don't call it databases. Nobody knows what that is. For us, research it works pretty well. Your mileage might vary on that. Um, but as you can see, it sort of tells you, well, what, if I go here, what, what am I going to get? OK, well, I, I am trying to research something, so I'll click that one. I do want an ebook, so that's probably where that one is. I want to search the catalog, that's probably where that is. So, you know, focus on that call to action or that what do I do next type of language. And that should um, Another thing that we can do, uh, we're, we're detail oriented creatures, we like, we like our words. Now uh, we've got buildings full of words, right? On our websites, we need to do the opposite, we need to kill the clutter. So for visual design and for language, um, remove that. Remove the clutter that helps to increase the focus. So try to think, you know, what's the main thing on this page? And then everything should point to that. The content you write, images, etc. should point to that. So don't do this. <laughs> Some website is on there. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Looks a little like Amazon. Um, sort of a modern page. Don't do this. Uh, don't do this either. This is a rather large public library. I'm pretty sure they have at least one web development librarian. Um, I would hope. I think they could probably do a little better. Um, I would guess, well, I actually have an example next slide of a small public library that's doing a much better job. Um, you know, an awesome library. Um, I love their, their tagline, speaking volumes. That's pretty cool. I'm sure all this is great content, but what's wrong with this page? Somebody help me out. Too many words. Too many words, you're right. Um, not really broken up really well if you're looking at it. Not yeah, it's not visual at all. It's, it's something that you would read, right? Um, and, and lose the clip art, I'm just saying. Higher graphic design. I'm sure they have one, um, as big as they are. Or I'm sure there's one somewhere in New Orleans. <laughs> I'm guessing. Um, they can do better, so we need to do better than that. And here's a small public library close to Topeka in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, it's doing a really good job. They used to have a horrible website, honestly. Uh, but they upped their game. They got a new library director. 
uh, they hired some web staff, and they have improved their library, library's website quite a bit. So all those things I was talking about earlier when we were looking at the construction, they've done really well. A lot of white space, it's broken up really well. Pretty much everything, you just visually looking at it, you can sort of tell what it is. Um, they, they've got the, the normal, the logo in the top left, the search box in the top right. They've done a good job, I think. Based on WordPress, it's responsive, it works really well. Um, you're like a city of 40, 50,000 people, something like that. So a much smaller library than, say, New Orleans public. Um, this can be done pretty easily just by thinking about it a little more, making it a little more visual, and killing a lot of <laughs> clutter, right? Killing the words. Oh, that sounds so bad to say, killing the words. <laughs> Don't tell the librarians I said that. Um, also, these days, you need to include social on your websites, social media channels. So that's pretty much how the modern web works. So how many of you guys have used social media this morning so far? I know some of you have because you're tweeting, <laughs> using the hashtag, I've seen some of that. Quite a, maybe, probably two-thirds of you guys have. Who has a social media account of some sort? Yeah. Your libraries? Same thing, right? Your customers? <laughs> yeah, same thing. Um, that's just how the modern web works, so we need to make sure there are places, easy places for them to comment and share the stuff that we do with, at our library's website. So my library's website, we do that in a few different ways. I mean, we, we have social media accounts and all the major social media accounts that are out there. We advertise that, the footer of our website, every page. So little easy links showing people where we are. Um, we'll have share buttons on our articles that we'll share to Facebook or Twitter, that kind of thing. We have comments that you can leave um, just on the website through a few different ways. Um, what we don't have yet and what we're developing this year is good, sort of scary and new and different for us is an editorial content calendar. So we have a small marketing department. They have an editorial content calendar for their newsletter and their e-newsletter and major events that are happening. You know, they know nine months out what they're going to focus on. Web website guys, not so much. We're a bit more flighty <laughs> that way. Um, we're going to try to combine the two so that if there's a major thing going on at the library, if you go to our print newsletter, our e-newsletter, our Facebook page, our website, you kind of see the same stuff. That's, that's a big challenge for us, if you think about it. Uh, we, we're a big library. We're, our social media teams are made up of different people, um, people producing the content on the website, different people sometimes. So it's a lot of coordination. It should be a lot of fun. Um, but in the end, our, our goal is to make sure people you know, have, have the content we want them to have. So we'll see, we'll see how that works. Um, fingers crossed, right? Also, okay, so this building is pretty cool, is it not? Pretty new building. It's got the little towery thing um, up on top. Pretty cool looking. Um, this building is a destination site for the area, right? People come here just to hang out, just to see the library. It's a fairly new building. They, they come to see the building, right? Uh, my library is that way too. This is actually an event at my library. It's an author talk the kids are forced to go. So. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell some of those really The teachers, they're like, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> and the kids, not so much. <laughs> Why do I have to be here? But um, our library buildings are destination sites, right? For the community. You do stuff there. Guess what? Our websites are becoming destination sites as well. People come to our digital branches. They want to do stuff there. So, um, the other side of that, we have to have something for them to do when they visit, right? So we do, you know, in the buildings, I bet this library has a kids area. So when the kids come and visit, there's something for them to do. Same with the adults. Our websites need to be the same way, not just a little brochure. Okay, I'm done, whatever. Um, we need to have something for them to do. So 
make sure you know your stuff is easy to find on your website, first of all. Again, that's why we have those big blue buttons. That's why we're pushing some, some big events as well. But even I think even more important, um, our library websites have some unique connections to some content that we have that you can only get on the digital branch or on the website. Never really thought about it that way before, but it does. So the library catalogs, for example. Only place you can get to that is on your website, pretty much. Um, and actually, even, even more than that, so your full collection of stuff, it's not living on the shelf, is it? Because hopefully some of that stuff is checked out right now, right? <laughs> so the stuff that's checked out, how do you get to that? What do you think? <laughs> it's from your catalog, from your website. It's the only way to get that. Or wait three months and go visit the shelf again. <laughs> Darn, it's still not there. <laughs> That's not a good way to do it, right? Um, so, your website is the only way to access your full collection of stuff. Pretty important. Um, Ebooks, can't, can't look at the shelf for that, right? Unless you put some little box spacers on it. The <laughs> um, only place to get that is through your library's website. Your databases, how much are you paying for databases? or a consortium bank for databases, etc. Only place to get that is your library's website. It's like three major collections. You know, something that supports your reference department, something that supports your whole library. Growing, growing collection. So is your ebook collection growing? Are you spending more on that? We are. A lot of libraries are experienced. I actually read an article they, they, they did a study and they're showing that physical book spending is going down and, and use is going down, but ebook collections and ebook use is going up. Um, that just makes sense in a way. Makes what we do a lot more important, doesn't it? <coughs> Let's think about it again. Okay, so number three, customers. The third C of, of website user experience. Probably the most important one are our customers, right? Without customers, why are we making this stuff in the first place? So, put your customers first. Um, this is part of the kids area of my library website. We have, I'm spoiled. We have a really cool mural that goes around. It's a really cool kids area. If you're ever in Topeka, come visit the library. You'll like it. I will give you a tour. <laughs> Which means we'll look at server rooms. <laughs> All right, so. Put your customers first, not the staff, not you guys, because, I mean, you guys probably are building the website, and if you're not, it's okay because you can train staff, right? This is how you use the website. You can train them. They're, they're paid to use it, in a way. Um, and if there's something that, that your staff is missing, but that your customers really don't need, like, you know, those long lists of links and shortcuts and junk like that, that maybe your reference librarians really, really want, you can build that for them, put it on the internet, put it on a special page that only they can get to, that kind of thing. So they have their tools, because that's important, but it doesn't necessarily need to live on your library's website. There, there's some things like that. Remember, we're killing the clutter for our customers. <coughs> Not for our staff, just figure out different ways to do that. So build them the expert version somewhere else. Um, but make the website for your customers. One way to do this is to focus on uh, personas, that kind of thing. You know, if you're building, if you're starting today, you're going to build a website. You can't build it for everyone in the community because if you're trying to build it for the three-year-old and the 78-year-old, you're not going to build the same thing, right? It's going to get confusing really fast. So look at your library strategic plan or at least their goals for the next three years and figure out, okay, well, it looks like, for example, my library, but we're actually going through some some strategic planning right now. Big goal for us is to have that, sort of that ALA thing. Every child ready to read by kindergarten. That really means we're focusing on parents, right? So we're not going to build, at least in, in my case, we're not building the website for the two-year-old. Woohoo! Big button to click on. Um, we're building it for the parents so they know what's going on, that kind of thing. Um, so that means, in essence, I'm building a website for a 30-year-old. 30-year-old mom, 30-year-old dad, that kind of thing. 
Um, and if I look at demographics, at least like from our Facebook page, that's pretty much who's going to our Facebook page. Good two-thirds of our Facebook audience would be females age 25 to 45. That's in, in Topeka, Kansas, in the middle of the country, that's moms right there. That's our target audience for one of our major library goals. So if I build content that they like, and I build websites that they like to use, I'm helping the library hit our strategic plan. So a good way to do that is to look at a persona, which is just sort of a made-up person. You know, you, you look at your stats, you say, okay, I want to focus on a 30-year-old female. And then you, you name her, you give her a little paragraph background, how much she makes, what kinds of stuff she likes to do, based on, you know, trends in, in your service area. And some, some businesses, some organizations go so far as to make a little stand-up cutout of that person, put it right in front of the web designer. <laughs> So think of her, think of him, when you're building this website. It really helps. It, it does. So we built it for, for, ah, for this person. Most likely, those other people in your service area will also figure out how, how to use the website, too. That's, that's just how it works these days. Um, everyone else will be fine, I'm sure. The other part of that is just knowing your users. So for library websites anyway, most likely these are not first time users. These are people who know how to use your catalog, know how to use your, your website just a little bit. So don't focus on sort of what we talked about earlier, you know, explaining every little detail, what it is, et cetera, because they're most likely your more expert users visiting your website. So again, kill the clutter. So this is the bad version of my library website. We have a, we do test proctoring. Um, look at that huge explanation for what what it should really say is we'll help you with test proctoring. Bring a number two pencil. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there's maybe a few more details in that, but it, it stretches. If, if I were to print out the whole page, it would be down here somewhere. Um, we need to change the wording on it, right? Because most likely the person needs to know where, when, who, that kind of stuff. Um, instead of the narrative details about this problem. <laughs> so also, um, ask for feedback. Ask your customers if they like your website and then fix if they don't, right? Um, quick little usability test. Something by the reference desk or the cert desk. You visited our website, what did you like? What, what seemed clunky, what's missing, he asked those three questions. That's pretty much what we need. Um, if you're looking for names of things, like your, your downloadables page, you know, come up with four or five names and another, and ask your customers, what would you call this? Do that for a week, you know, have the search staff actually ask that to everybody. You'll know what your customers want to call it. Um, so, I have touched on construction content and customers, and I think it's time for you guys. I think it's time for some questions, because that's my, that's my presentation. So we've got, I think, a few minutes for questions. Yeah? I noticed on your site you had some link to shopping time and travel. Yeah. Um, all right. So actually, let me go back there. Um, She was asking about the shop dine button. Now we have McDonald's in our library. No, <laughs> we do have um, a cafe in the library, so I advertise that. And our friends have a bookstore, a, a boutique kind of thing. So you can buy used books and other jewelry and stuff. It's actually a pretty cool store. Um, trying to push that. We have an art gallery, which is the art gallery. That is pulling from our blogs. We have a number of um, sections on our website. And actually, most of those are <coughs> they match up with collections in our building. So we we have rearranged our collection to have like the travel section and stuck all the travel books together. And they're responsible for the blog as well. So that's how we do that. Good question. What else? Yeah. What CMS are you using? What CMS are we using? We're using WordPress. 
Uh, we tried Expression Engine before that, way a long time ago, and moved to uh, WordPress seven or eight years ago, and love it. And you can support multiple blogs at once? Yeah, yeah, for multiple blogs. It's one, one big happy WordPress thing. Yeah. What theme did you select in WordPress? Ah, what theme did we select? That's a good question. I would need to ask my web designer. But um, we use, so, so he, he built it, custom, custom design, um, based on, there's, there's what's called some skeleton designs out there that just have like the responsive thing and pretty much nothing else. If you pulled it up and just plopped it on your website, it would look really ugly. But it's got all the proper coding behind it. And I don't remember which of those things he used. Yeah, I think all of us, or many of us, get used to trying to say, like you say, so many things like you want to say, how to get a lighter card, how many, how many weeks is it is the item um, available for, how do I renew a book, where do I find all this? Um, so it's hard to like get away from that. And I'm wondering, do you A, have that, and would it be just to check it out? Like is it a fat FAQ there, or yeah. what kind um, of thing do you use for that function? Good question. So yeah, underneath that button, so there's the catalog, but then there's also some what am I supposed to do kind of links, you know, how does it work? And so if they want that level of information, like how many things can you check out, that kind of stuff, we've got it there. But yeah, off, off to the side rather than in front of their face. Yeah. What tool do you use for statistics? What tools do we use for statistics? We are using Google Analytics. It's free. It's easy. <laughs> And it, it's it's pretty detailed. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever see is that search box for searching the site? Yeah, it, it's for searching the site and for searching the catalog. And the catalog. <coughs> yeah. So do you ever tweak your site content or design based on what people are searching your site for? Yeah. Good question. She asked, do we tweak the site depending on what people are searching for? We have before. Okay. Um, for, I uh, can't remember the thing specifically, but we named something uh, differently than what our customers were, were searching. searching. Okay. And so we changed the, the name of the page. Okay. And now it pops up. <clears throat> our library director noticed it too because she was like, well, I type in this and it's not there. Okay. Like, it's, yeah, it is. It's number five on the list. <laughs> so, well, okay. So we, we tweaked it. Okay. But yeah, we, that's a good question. We do. That's, that's a really good way to find out the language your customers use. Yeah. What else? How did you get the figures for who's accessing you by way of the you know, laptop or the Okay, um, how, did, how do we get the yeah. different device analytics? That, that's from Google Analytics. It is. It, it's one of the, one of the things. They, they'll actually go as far as screen sizes and say, you know, so many people are using 1024 by 768 or whatever the bigger ones are now. <laughs> nobody's using that size anymore. Um, so it, it will tell you that, and now it will also tell, like, um, smartphone screen sizes. It'll actually tell you devices. So most of those mobile devices, a good half of them would be iPhone-y type things. Um, so we can tell what our customers are using. Good question. Yeah. Does your website for events and such, does it track that in a separate, like we use Event Keeper for events? Does, that, does your website track it that way or does it track it directly? So tracking? When, I'm sorry, when people sign up for an event that's being posted oh. to your library. Okay. Do you yeah, know you know that's what? Tracked? It, that's a good question. Um, we are just experimenting with online sign-up for events. We haven't had that before, so we use EMS for our event management stuff. We're, EMS is sort of clunky for customers, but we're a major meeting facility in town as well. We do like 7,000 meetings every year. We're, we're a big building um, for 180,000 people or so, and, and cheap meeting space, <laughs> so they use us, of course. Um, so it works really well for that, but we haven't had a registration. So we are using a free and easy tool right now, eventbrite.com, and we're a library still, so that's in pilot project phase right now. We, it's sort of funny, we have a committee for that, and they've picked four events to experiment with, and they'll report back. And, but 
it's free, it's easy, it works really well. It will give you detailed statistics, etc. So that, that's how we're doing it. There's also some, I mean, it, EMS has a module that does that as well for 10,000 bucks a year. Mm -hmm. like, hmm, let's try the free one first. And if you're a really small library, we just use um, a Google Calendar and a Google Form. Yeah. There you go. So and it just keeps track of everything because it's Google. They they use a Google a Google Form for that. That's that's an that's an awesome way to do it too. Yeah. How concerned are you with the technology that people are using? Because sometimes I think some of our users are home using Windows 95 still, and they might not have drop downs and the sure. images aren't going to show. And dialogue. Oh yeah, so so she was asking, you know, how concerned am I about the about the technology and she mentioned dial up. <gasps> yeah, that's right. I'm in Kansas, there's a lot of rural librarianship going on there too. I am okay, for those people I am not concerned about. This sounds mean and I don't mean it mean, but they are not my customers. Uh, honestly, if you're using dial-up these days, you're not really using the web. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not going to work, <laughs> pretty much. Um, except maybe to suck down your email, and that's the extent of it. Um, so hopefully those people can sign up for our e-newsletter. <laughs> but yeah, the rest of the web is not going to work so well for them anymore. So until they speed that up a little, I can't, I just can't serve them. For those people, um, sort of the same. So. Google Analytics will actually tell me who's using that kind of stuff. Um, my, my part of the country, my, our customers, most of them are fairly up to date with that. Um, so you're not overly concerned? No, there's 5% or under that are using bad technology. Um, you know, and, and that will vary. You know, my 78 year old mother in law has great technology but doesn't know how to use it. So that, that's, that's the bigger issue for that, I think. Um, but yeah, so I'm a digital branch manager in a way, and those are my customers. So somebody not using the web, or somebody that has bad enough technology that they really can't use the web, I'm not really focused on them. I'll say it that way. Um, sounds sort of mean, but it, it's really not, because that's just not who I'm serving. They buy a new computer, suddenly they are my customer. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so it looks like on your website you have like a search engine optimization plugin. Uh, do you think that's really a benefit for a public library? Or how beneficial is that? So the search engine optimization for library websites, I think it's really important. Um, just because, you, well, for two reasons. One, it, it helps you with, with language and removing the clunkiness of your website just for your customers, but also even more importantly, it, it helps search engines, like especially Google, find your stuff. That's really important. If you've ever noticed, um, these days if you do a search, you know, open up your computer at home, do a search in Google, it's gonna find local stuff first. That's probably you're signed in somewhere or, or it's remembering through cookies and stuff. It's pushing local stuff first and then it spreads out. So if we have an article on our travel blog about some local events happening, it's going to find that first. And if we do the SEO thing well, it will be in those top 10 things. So yeah, I think that's really important. So that's, that's, yeah, that's why I say that. <laughs> and if we were an ad agency, you'd see ads popping up all over after you did it. So. What's, the, what's the one statistic that you get real excited about when you evaluate your Google? <laughs> Gee whiz. I mean, you've got so much to choose from. What's the one that? statistic that I get excited about? I mean, when you get your report, what do you, what do you look at? Yeah. You know, um, honestly, what, personally, I'm, I'm the person who tracks social media analytics. And I, I get excited when, when engagement numbers go up. And, and also, there's, there's a way I, I sort of track um, con, what's called conversion. So people going from Facebook to my website. When those numbers raise up, I get pretty excited because it, it tells me that the Facebook team's doing a good job and people found our content, saw our content, and went to our website. So I get excited about that stuff because it shows use. I get excited about the Facebook team. <laughs> 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 yeah. How many people are in Facebook? Okay. Yeah, I, 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 
So she, she asked how many people are on my Facebook team. So again, big library, 220 staff. <laughs> um, we have a Facebook team of 12 to 14 people. Wow. It goes up and down. You can have a Facebook team of two. That works too, right? You get Monday through Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. So with a Facebook team of that size, how often are you posting? They post once a week. Um, yeah, so what we do, we have assigned everybody days. So like on Saturday with one other person. We've got two people assigned per day. And then our goal is, you know, two to four um, posts per day, and then answer questions and that kind of stuff as they come up too. So it's not really that big of a deal, and more people can play. Um, with Twitter, we've got a similar thing, maybe one person per day on that team, so maybe seven, five to seven people on that team. Um, same, same sort of thing, two to four posts a day and answer questions as they come up. So it's not that much work. Yeah. But just enough that yeah. social media is fun right now, um, and so more people can play. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a scrolling news this time? And if so, how many and how important? Uh, yeah, this this thing scrolls. Yeah. That's what you're talking about. Uh, we usually I think have four or five things there. Those are um, usually our events or big things that are happening. How often do you change? Um, they change every week. Yeah. So as we question. Um, well, I hate to interrupt, yeah, but yeah. we're keeping to a schedule. We're trying to. So we're going to take a 15 minute coffee break and then move into our uh, case studies. Our keynote speaker will be here to answer any more questions um, for the day, but let's move around the clock.